My name is Adam Blunkett and I played Scrooge. Preparing for Scrooge was really challenging because this show is based on a stage production, which I've never been in. And so I had to go look at the video of the stage production, but then try to think kind of out of the box of this could be anywhere. It could be in a field, it could be in a church, it could be in a house. And so I really had to keep an open mind, but luckily the team at B-Fan had all been in the show before. I'd like to give a shout out to Gustavo Ramirez, who actually had been Scrooge previously, who really, really helped me with that. And so Scrooge, like I said, was very personal to me. So the character side, I went back and reread the original text of the actual book. Because we're so used to seeing the film iteration, there's a lot of nuance that kind of gets lost. And so in the actual pages of the book, I was able to find inspiration, little tiny details that I forgot that ended up meaning a lot to me in the end. When they came and took me off in So Ballet Fantastique likes doing genre-defying work. And what I mean by that is that, is it a ballet? Is it a movie? Is it a play? Is it a work of theater? Um, is it a musical? And I love making people ask that question and then maybe, hopefully their answer is like, I don't care, I like it and I get it and it resonates with me. And so to do that with this project, um, Donna and I and our creative team, when we first came up with the idea, we. I remember sitting at my mom's kitchen table and just thinking, how do we make this not feel too, like, prissy? How do we make it feel, like, how can we give it some grit? And like, because Christmas Carol has this sense of, um, like, it, it has some, some hard, some hard edges to it. Scrooge has some hard edges that need to get smoothed out. And especially, you know, when we knew we were using music, like, let it snow and I'll be home for Christmas and these really, like beautiful, warm, sweet songs. Um, and that's where the idea to narrate the story through the perspective of Smokey Joe Marley came. And our creative team was digging through songs. So we came up with, right, we want to work with Haley. She does gorgeous jazz music. She has all these songs already, but she said that she's willing to learn some new ones for us. So we started digging through all these like lost songs of the 40s, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And we found this song called The Ghost of Smokey Joe. And it was like, that's it. You know, not only do we have this, this incredible actor who works with Ballet Fantastique, Adam Goldthwait, but he can sing. And what if he's, instead of Jacob Marley, what if he's Smokey Joe Marley? And then the idea of the ghost brides came from that, which is like, in ballet, there's the Willies and Giselle, and like the the Ballet Blanc, you see all these dancers in white and, and so many iconic ballets, and it was like, they're the women who have been jilted at the altar, and it's the ghosts that are haunting men who have done them wrong. And I was like, well, what if we do a spoof on that with the Ghost Bride? So hmm. um, kind of it, the inside jokes for the ballet, the Bella Tomins in the audience. Did I say <laughs> that right? Um, anyway, so working with... Adam and Haley is just an incredible treat. They're truly both world-class artists in their own right, and they brought so much to the movie. I'm so glad they were up for being part of the project. You had plenty money, 19. Being on location was really helpful in a lot of the places because there was already an ambiance of it being the time period that we were supposed to inhabit and exist in. So I, I found that helpful. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how you can act a part without having, like you don't, sometimes shots are only this much of you or whatever, so you're not constantly thinking about your ballet technique and the acting portion of it. Sometimes you're just acting and you just happen to be wearing a point shoe as versus like walking around on stage and having to do all the ballet technique on top of the acting. So kind of segmenting it differently than you would on a stage. When you're preparing to get on stage, like you can get into this mindset and then you get to live it for a whole two hours and you're just that character and that's kind of the only thing on your mind. I mean, maybe you play other people within the ballet, but um, 
when you're on stage, you're in it. And even if you make a mistake, like we're taught, just keep dancing, just keep going, and don't break your character for the audience. Um, and I'd say on the set, it was a lot different because you would take, you would do a take, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you get really hungry and like have a like, <laughs> snack, <laughs> and then you're like, okay, now you have to be sad again. <laughs> like, Wait, I just ate an almond. Like I don't know, I can be sad after that. But um, it definitely, it, it was harder for me to break character and then get back into character. Um, and worry that the camera, because like Hannah said, it would definitely like really catch your features, and like you really need to be like, okay, in this scene, the camera's in my face, like I, I can't not be serious in this scene. Versus on stage, you're in it the whole time, so there wasn't, there isn't a breaking of character, uh, hopefully. <laughs> I think a lot of the times when we would try something in the studio, and then we would know before we got to that location, it was like, okay, we're probably gonna have to change and adapt our choreography, which we did several times. Like, oh, I can't do this promenade, I'm on concrete and my shoe is being destroyed now and I <laughs> need my shoes. So we yeah. would kind of have to adapt things um, once we got there, which is something you don't do when you are doing a stage performance. I mean, you've done that piece a million times and you're gonna go on stage and you're gonna do it the exact same way versus film was, was very different. It was adapting to how much space you had, what kind of floor texture you were working with. I think we danced on wood, yeah. carpet, everything, concrete, marley, like ev everything. Um, and so that was definitely like, oh, you need to use less momentum or oh, you need to lift me more because I can't do that on carpet now. So, right. yeah, so yeah, it was different. Yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't know how it felt for you though. <laughs> well, pretty much the same. It, it was just kind of hard to not really know what, which version that you were going to do. But once you were there, you figured it out quickly, yeah. so. I think it was uh, the Adam going through the door scene. Oh, that's a good one. I mean, we had done that's some other things one. as well, but there was one of those things where she had the idea, I knew exactly what she meant, I knew exactly how to do it, and we just managed to, it, it came together really pretty quick. Like once the idea was there, we had to go somewhere else, but oh, let's just, let's just do this real mm -hmm. quick. And it was not difficult, but the magic was high. It was, yeah, it was just like, so good. That's good, like that's gonna mm -hmm. be a nice moment. If we can keep doing things like that, mm -hmm. stringing it together, I think we've got a movie. I would say that dancing in the film, we got the experience of repeating it over and over again, which was n new for me because usually when you're performing on stage, you only get that one moment in time and you can't say, hey, audience, like I messed that up. Can I do it again? <laughs> um, and so I liked the fact that I could have more than one opportunity to maybe perfect something. But then at the same time, it's a lot of stop, stopping and starting, stopping and starting. So like you have to have patience that you might not have to have. The cathedral scene with Scrooge represents the emotional peak to me because it's that moment where he finally realizes that his actions do have direct and indirect consequences on the world around him. And he realizes his selfishness, it doesn't even necessarily have so much to do with greed as his selfishness and seeing that because he literally doesn't care about his employees, like Tiny Tim's future and the Cratchit's future and who knows who else are affected by him caring only about himself. And realizing that is a very heavy burden and it's not something that you could easily just get over. And so to me, it's one of those moments where he essentially grew up all in one minute in that scene. For me, it might have been Fezziwig's party when I think, so we had this really long day, we were trying to get it done before the state of Oregon um, went on kind of this freeze lockdown. Mm, Everyone yeah. wasn't able to rehearse nearly as much as we wanted to. We'd never been able to be in the space because we were filming it two hours away. We had this incredible time deadline because we knew we had to film it at night. We'd learned that at this point in the filmmaking process. <laughs> and so, we, we were there and Gustavo again, shout out to Gus, he just, he really yeah. has, he can see these uh, things in his mind in terms of choreography in a space. He nailed it with the whole spacing of that piece and the choreography of how it moved through these unique rooms. Again, not our first choice, not even our fifth choice of location, but it just turned out perfectly. And he brought us, he. Jeremy and I had been shooting at the church that day at Trinity mm -hmm. Episcopal for the Nature Boy scene. 
and we showed up and Gus and the dancers with his music on his cell phone, they played this song and they walked me through it. And I had goosebumps all over and I was just like, yes, this, like I feel it, I can see it. And that is just an example of the team energy that came together to produce this movie and everybody just had a strength that they brought to the project. And then Jeremy mm. um, decided like, I, I think, We've worked together enough that I could like, we try to keep it together, but I felt your panic, <laughs> like saw it in your <laughs> eyes. We're running out of time. The incredible um, manager there had been so gracious and she finally just said, we've got to go, you've got to leave and you're out of time. And Jeremy like was like, scrap it. I'm going in. <laughs> I don't think he said it that way, but it's you, have, you have like he took his handheld camera that I think with a new toy yeah, you said you've new, never yeah. like, tried right. before. I heard somebody say once that interesting things do not belong in production when it comes to like making a film. Don't try anything new like on the day. Well, but I was watching Gus's choreography, and he's like, "I'm going to walk you through it." And so I sat there behind him with a phone. We walked through the dance. It's like that looks great. Mm -hmm. That's I would love to do that, but I'm not. We weren't necessarily equipped. And then we suddenly had a deadline. I'm like, you know what? If we can do this, you know, it can just be one take, and we get all the way through, and everybody's work gets shown in the best light, and it just feels like this journey through this party. Like and you're so there. We, like we you're did it. The yeah, party. we we had this whole idea of how it would go, and then when we got there, it was like we had to adapt. Mm -hmm. And so it's one more thing where it was making the most of what was available you know, pivoting, making something great in that moment. And like, hopefully that shows up, because I think that scene turned out to be one of the very best, where it's just that like you feel like a party. It takes you, it takes you there and it transports you. Money, got lots and lots of so Christmas Future has a lot of power because she is explaining to Scrooge what will happen if he continues on his current course. and. And speaking to, you know, what, what has not yet come and, and what might and where the intersection between your control of that and where, like what's in your control and what's not out of your control. And I found Christmas Future to be a really comforting way to approach uncertainty, especially right now. Like that there is a lot that we don't know and there's a lot that we don't get to pick and there's a lot and not to be a total downer but there I mean ultimately we are mortal and it was a really powerful way to distill that into a character because fiction is is amazing in that regard as you can you can boil something down to okay what, what do I want my Christmas futures mm -hmm to be like and what should they be like not only for Scrooge and not only you know for the spirit of Christmas future but what what does Carrie's Christmas future want to look like and and what can I control now to make that come about and not a future that I find repulsive or terrifying Valley Fantastique does a minimum of two full-length narrative world premieres a year. And that is kind of unheard of in the ballet world. And that's because it's crazy and it's way too much work. But I know almost like how to do it. And um, our creative team, shout outs to Donna, our artistic director, who comes up with not only all of the the concept work and agonizes over every detail of how a story unfolds, but also chooses the music and designs the costume. So she's a, she's just amazing. We could not do it without her. If you're gonna take one thing away from this film, please enjoy all the hard work that's gone behind the scenes to bring you a new innovative storytelling process from Ballet Fantastique. I will just wanna say thank you so, so much for helping us, for being here for us. Thank you for Letting us do art and letting us create something different, letting us evolve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because without, you know, like it's very hard times, it's very difficult times, but without this, we would not have never been able to do something like this or come out with ideas or do something different. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So like, you know, I'm just grateful for everybody that is supporting us, everybody that is donating. It's just a blessing. Mm -hmm. And like, thank you so much for keep doing that. Mm -hmm. I very yeah. appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. I think that the dancers of Valley Fantastic really wanted to like keep not keep magic, but we wanted to give magic to people in a time when it feels like it can feel very hopeless. And uh, we knew that we couldn't do that on a stage in the way that we normally do. And so that's why I think this film was really important to all of us because you don't choose the life of an artist, especially ballet, unless you really genuinely want to share your love of dancing and the magic of it with people. And so the fact that we were able to do that for people in a different and creative new way, I think gave us hope and we hope that it also gives you hope. I, ho I hope we managed to really get the emotion into the story, that people see it and that maybe they can apply a little bit to their life. You know, there's the transformative power of looking at where you've come from where you are and where you're going and how your choices will affect that and how it'll affect, affect everyone around you. Yeah. You know, at this time when people are really apart from each other, apart from their family and loved ones, like maybe this is a reminder of just how great it is to be able to have family and loved ones around you mm -hmm. and how you're always creating your future as you go. So hopefully we told a story and it takes people on a little bit of a journey and they, they come away feeling good at the end.